Today is Trinity Sunday, as we had already mentioned. And what this means is that God is three, but he is also one. And this is a doctrine that has been argued about and developed for centuries, particularly the first few centuries of the church. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but it's a word we have used to describe the God of the Bible, the God of reality. And the God of the Bible has revealed himself in a way that is both unified and one, but is also three persons. And so these are kind of these simple concepts that are incredibly complex. And this is what manifests in the doctrine of the Trinity. It's really just a way of describing who God is. And so I want to go through and basically talk about how each person of the Trinity is God, um, talk about God's unity, and then talk about each one as being a distinct person. Uh, I had a whole uh, preliminary section um, on God's uh, transcendence, God's omnipotence, God's omniscience, because these things are beyond creation. God is not a creature, right? God is, God created everything, but he's outside of creation. So he's not like a God of, of the Greeks. He's not in a pantheon, like he's not Zeus or Odin within creation and maybe somehow involved with creation, but still a part of creation. And he's not like the God of Hinduism, Bra Brahman, where God is everything, like God is materially part of everything. Everything we see is just an illusion. The Hindus call this Maya, and there's no distinctions in reality. Everything is one. These are the kinds of things, this is false, these are the kinds of things that that drug addicts, people who use hallucinogen, uh, hallucinogenics, who tap into demons, and then demons basically preach to them when they're, on the, when they're high, and they say, everything is one, man. So people on DMT come back and they're just like, man, this is all just an illusion, man. We're all just one. Everything is one together, man. So that's false, too. God is not in everything. God is transcendent. He is our, the creator God. He knows everything. He's all powerful. And the Bible teaches us this. And so we want to go through and kind of talk really quickly about um, these various aspects. So let's start off with God being one. Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheni Yahweh Ahad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's called the Shema. That was Hebrew. The, the, the Israelites, the Jews, would pray this prayer, this Hebrew prayer, right? Yeah, it is. It's kind of funny, right? It's, it's not, we don't speak that way. We speak in English now, but that was, that was their prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You know how we always pray uh, the Our Father? Like, Our Father, who art in heaven, right? We, play, we know that prayer, right? The Shema here, hear, O Israel, Shema, Hebrew is for here, that was their Our Father, they would pray that it was in their bones and God was one because they were living in a time where there were God, there were many gods. There was the God of the moon and the God of the harvest and all this stuff. There's all these different gods. But for Israelites, for old covenant, the old covenant church, they believed God was one. And there's there's multiple aspects to this. Um, there's, there's the aspect of him being unified and being one, but there's also the aspect of him being over other gods or saying other gods don't exist. So we have both language in scripture, that God is before all other gods and also that the gods don't actually um, exist in, in a meaningful sense. So, um, yeah, we even we see this here with the. Uh, the second word, right? The second, you will have no other gods before me. We see that God is, is a jealous God here. Uh, Isaiah 43, 10, before me, there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord and beside me, there is no savior, right? So God's oneness is talking about his exclusivity as the Lord, as God, as savior. Isaiah 46, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. No other gods are like him. Nothing is like him. God is unique. James 2.19, he says, you believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So we have, we have this New Testament affirmation that God is one. 
and that even demons believe that God is one. You believe there is one God, you do well. And then Paul tells us that there is only one God who justifies all men in Romans. Romans 3, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Right? So faith is this instrument of justification, but it's one God who justifies both of them. Paul to the Corinthians, uh, therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him. So there is one God, and he, who does he, he calls him the Father. So we see here that Paul is affirming this, the oneness of God, but he also refers to him as Father. So let's talk about that. The Father is God. We see the Father being developed in the Old Covenant, particularly at Sinai. And if you've ever, when I was in seminary, I had to work through some passages in Exodus. And it's amazing how many times it's like, oh, this is the children of Israel. How many times God's people are called the children of Israel? They're children, and God is the Father. And we start seeing this paternal language right there in the Old Covenant. God brings them out, and He is their Father. In Exodus 4, God refers to Israel as his firstborn son. This is what he instructs Moses to tell Pharaoh. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son and your firstborn. Throughout the Old Covenant, there's these, these, these relationships with God and Israel, with God and the kings and all, this, all these things that always typologically represent or often typologically represent Jesus. So Israel as the firstborn son is representing Christ as the, as the son, as the, the, the firstborn son. When Moses is about to die, he sings a song in Deuteronomy 32. And speaking of Yahweh, uh, speaking of Yahweh God to the Israelites, he says, Is not he your father who created you, who made you and established you? Later on, re Moses refers to God as the rock who begot them, the God who fathered them, that they were his sons and daughters. So God begins to have this paternal relationship with his people. During the time of the kings, we see God describe himself as Solomon's father. In God's covenant with David, we read this in 2 Samuel 7. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up for your seed after you. I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. It's really remarkable language here. This is about Solomon. God is the father of King Solomon, of David's seed. But what's the, what's the fullness of this, this prophecy is about Jesus. It's about the son, Solomon typologically representing this. Solomon building a house for God, just as Jesus is building a house for God, which is the church. We see similar things in the Psalms. There's, there's all this language of God being the father of the kings. Um, Psalm 2 is very famous, and we often think of it just purely. I, I've often read Psalm 2 as being purely about Christ, which it is, but it's actually about Solomon. It's initially about Solomon. It's about David's son. We see the same thing in Psalm 68 and 89. In the prophets, there's, this, there's a preference for marital language. We often see God as being the husband of Israel and Israel being the spouse, often the unfaithful spouse. Um, but we do see paternal language in, in the uh, uh, prophets as well, particularly Isaiah, uh, Hosea, and Jeremiah. For example, in Jeremiah 31, we read this, For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. As we move forward through history, particularly the intertestamental period, um, we have uh, apocryphal records. So there's these, there's these books that are not in the canon, but the church has read them in their history. And we see that uh, the Tobit, Syriac, the Solomon of Wisdom, these books were written between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And in there, we see that God is often referred to as Father in there as well. It becomes a, a, a kind of more um, 
uh, grounded staple of the way that God would talk about Israel. So for example, in Tobit 13, uh, we read, he has shown you his greatness even there. Exalt him in the presence of every living being because he is our Lord and he is our God. He is our father and he is God forever. So we see this kind of development happening as history progresses. And then when we get to the New Testament, and this is, this is true with all persons of the Trinity, the fullness, we start seeing the fullness of who God is and kind of it's, it's full in, in, the, in the full light of the new covenant. John 6, 27, Jesus says this, God the Father has set his seal on him. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we read this from Paul, yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things. We, we already read this. Okay, so we start to see that God is, is described as Father uh, in both covenants and then even in the intertestamental period. So let's move on to the Son. We've seen that the Son is typologically anticipated by Solomon. We also see that the Son, and these are debated things, but we see the Son, we see kind of triune echoes in, in the Old Testament. Um, with Christophanes and Theophanes. So often the angel of the Lord will appear. Uh, the Lord appeared to Abraham and he was in the form of a person, right? He eats with Abraham. We see that the angel of the Lord leads Joshua's army into Canaan. The angel of the Lord often appears to people in the Bible. So uh, we see that these kind of bodily manifestations of God, I would say are manifestations of the Son. They're not the incarnation, but they're some kind of manifestation of the sun. This is debated, but the, the, it does suggest some kind of, sometimes we'll keep, people call it a binitarian uh, explanation in the Old Testament or anticip anticipation. But I actually think there's trini it's trinitarian because we also see the spirit in the Old, Old Testament as well. We see the Father, we see the angel of the Lord, and we see the spirit. Also, when the prophets speak, it's, it's often preceded by, and then the word of the Lord came to the prophets. And we see that as well. We see this right at creation too. We see that we see God at creation and then God speaks. So the word speaks creation. And then we also see the spirit hovering over the waters. So there's also this kind of Trinitarian aspect here. Okay. So um, when we get to John, what Caleb read, we see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then the Word became flesh. So we see that Jesus is God here right in John 1. We see in uh, uh, Matthew 1, when the angel is speaking to Joseph, what does, he say, what does he say his name will be? There's two names that he says his name will be. Anybody remember? The obvious one? Jesus. Jesus which is, what's the, that's a, that's a Greek version of an old, of a Hebrew name, which is what? Yeshua, right, Yeshua, Joshua, which means, the Lord will save. yeah, Yahweh will save, the Lord will save. So we have this kind of, this, this close approximation there. And what's the other one? There, there's an there's a, the Isaiah prophecy that the angel says that's going to be fulfilled. Oftentimes, we sing this during Christmas. His, he said oh, we did? Okay, I didn't hear that. Who said that? Josiah? Zeke? No, your dad. Oh, you said Emmanuel? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> My apologies to the bishop. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Emmanuel, which means God with us, okay? So, so that is what Jesus is, is God with us. He's dwelling with us. Um, in John 8, we have this protracted theological debate between Jesus and what I envision to be like Presbyterian seminarians. And he basically, they're, so they're trying to go back and forth. And um, the Jews say to him, you are not 50 years old. And have you seen Abraham? And Jesus says to him, says to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Well, that is the name of God. God says, I am. Uh, Yahweh is, he is. Uh, when he reveals himself to Moses in the burning bush, he says, I am that I am. And so Jesus is saying, I am too. <laughs> I am God. So, so Jesus is God. He is. And they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them. So they passed by. And there's, there's another instance where Jesus forgives a man of his sins and they wanted to kill him as well because only God can forgive sins. So Jesus is doing these things that show that he is God. I had a, I had a, 
a good friend uh, in Afghanistan, uh, uh, a peer of mine, and we were talking about this. And, and at the time, he said, um, he said uh, Jesus never claims divinity. Jesus never claimed to be God. But that's not true. Jesus is doing that precisely. He's doing that precise thing in these moments. Okay, um, we have, oh yeah, okay, so we already went through that. What does Thomas say to Jesus? What does Thomas say to the resurrected Christ? He says, I don't, I'm not going to believe if I, right, my Lord and my God, right. Uh, so we see that Thomas ascribes, and then in our passage today, what are, what are the disciples doing to Jesus? What does it say? They're worshiping him. Worship only goes to God. Um, Okay, and then a few, um, a few passages here from the epistles. Romans 9, Paul says, Christ came who is over all the eternally blessed God. From Colossians, Paul talking about Christ says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead. In Titus, Paul talks about the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then lastly, in Colossians, Paul, speaking of the Son, says this, He is the image of the invisible God. This is why I think the Theophanies and the Christophanies are, are, are the Son. Because if people were able to behold God in a form, I, I would view it, I would believe that it would be the Son manifesting. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Right? By the Son, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things exist. This high, exalted language of who God is ascribed to Jesus Christ the Son. All right. So let's move on to the Spirit. As we said before, we see the Spirit at the creation hovering over the waters. We see the Spirit through the Old Covenant Church empowering leaders like Moses and the 70 elders. Numbers 11, uh, he, he empowers the judges. We're told in Judges 3 and 6, the Spirit fills Othniel. He fills Gideon. Uh, he, the Spirit fills kings. We, we're told in 1 Samuel 10 and 16 that the Spirit uh, is, uh, fills David. It also fills Saul. And Saul uh, uh, apostatized. Right? So that's something to keep in mind. And then, the pro and then the Spirit also fills the prophets like Ezekiel. It, it says, he sees the Lord and it says, and the Spirit came into me. Right? So we see the Spirit working throughout the Old Testament. And not only this, but it appears that all the Israelites had the Spirit in, in uh, uh, at least the time of the Exodus. In Isaiah 63, we, we read this. Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them, talking of the Israelites, who led them by the right hand of Moses? And God speaking to uh, all of Israel through the prophet Haggai says, According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. There's obviously, a, there's a qualitative difference. There's a more explosive power of the spirit in the new covenant. But we see the spirit at concentrated work in the old covenant with the old covenant people. And then we have several prophecies of the Old Covenant that the Spirit would empower Jesus. For example, Isaiah 11, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Um, and then once we get to Acts, we see, that, um, we see that Peter equates the Spirit with God. Um, Ananias and Sapphira lie to the Holy Spirit. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. And then later on, Peter says, you have not lied to men, but to God. Why am I pointing this out? The spirit is God, right? He's putting these things together. Acts 28, 25. Paul had said uh, one word. Um, oh yeah, okay. This is kind of more complicated. Let me try to break it down. Okay, so Acts 28, 25. Paul had said that the Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet. And then he quotes Isaiah 6, and it's, this, it's the famous encounter with Isaiah. Um, uh, it's what Dad read um, in, the, in the, uh, the altar, in the coal, and all of that. Okay, 
Paul is saying the Spirit spoke through Isaiah at this point where in that instance, Yahweh is speaking to Isaiah. So the eternal God, Yahweh, is speaking. Paul says the Spirit is speaking. So there's this, there's this uh, pairing of the Spirit is God here in this moment as well. That one's a little bit more complicated, but Acts 28, you can check that out. Um, and, then in, uh, and then this one's more straightforward. Uh, Second Corinthians, Paul says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. That's a very easy one. The Lord is the spirit, right? So the spirit is God, right? God is one father. Father is God. Son is God. Spirit is God. Now let's move on to the distinct persons and then we'll wrap things up real quickly. The reason why I'm talking about the distinct persons, this is the mystery. This is the difficulty is that um, this, the heresy that, that these passages refute um, is what's called Sabellianism or, um, oh, what's the other one? Modalism, yeah. So modalism or Sabellianism is what oneness Pentecostals believe. And it's an, old her it's an old heresy. Basically, they emphasize God's oneness to the point that there are no three persons that God is the God is just basically putting on different masks. It's like now I'm the father. Now I'm the spirit. Now I'm the son or like the way that water works, like water can be ice and then it can be fog and then it can be liquid, but it's still all water. I mean, the, like these like right bad Trinitarian analogies abound and they're often heretical. Like that is Sibelianism. That is modalism, that God is just appearing in different forms. But there's not three persons interacting with each other, but are still unified. So it's, it's a kind of a it's a it's a sometimes a tough distinction to wrap your head around. But that's the purpose of bringing these things up. And, and probably one of the most clearest examples of this is Christ's baptism. OK, and Christ's baptism is a recapitulation of the creation in, in the beginning. We have God speaking in the spirit hovering over the waters at Christ's baptism. We have God, the father speaking over his son and the spirit hovering over the waters. Once again, it's because Jesus is ushering in a new creation. That's really what's going on here. But we see all three of these persons interacting. So Luke three. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. OK, so you have the spirit descending on Jesus. These are separate things. And then we have a voice, a third one. A voice came from heaven, which said, you are my beloved son in you. I am well pleased. Right. So there's these are separate persons interacting all in the same moment here. Luke four, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan was led to the spirit in the wilderness. So the spirit and the son interacting here, but they're in concert with each other. Right. He's led by the spirit. The other the other significant one is the transfiguration. Matthew 17. While he was still speaking, Peter, this is kind of this funny moment where God interrupts Peter. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. So the father, this is my son. Well, who is he? Who has to be speaking there? The father, if that's his son. And he's speaking of him, right? Jesus isn't saying things like, I can't even think, I can't, you know, I, I was once the father and now I'm the son, right? These are different persons speaking. Okay. And then um, the, the last couple of examples is the coming of the spirit. And then we'll wrap things up here. Um, uh, John 15, uh, when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will testify to me. I'll just leave it at that. I have a bunch of other ones here, but it's, it's Jesus saying, I will send you the spirit from the father. So there's these distinct things happening, which is a big debate. The West is right, but uh, there's a big debate over uh, does the spirit proceed from the father or the father and the son? Our confessions say uh, uh, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father and the son. Um, but that, that's an aside. Okay. Um, 
So, so lastly, uh, we'll just wrap things up here. Um, we see these echoes of, of God in the Old Testament. And, and often, um, you, you even see it in the name of God. Uh, when, God is, when you read God, that's Elohim, which is a plural. It's an intensive plural, but it's singular. So even in the Hebrew language, and you know, scholars who are in the know are quick to say, well, the Old Testament writers didn't have ideas of the hypostatic union and Trinitarian you know, God. It, you know what? You're right. They didn't. But that's okay. I think that these things are inherently there. And you have the early fathers. You even have some reformed guys arguing this way. What does God say when he wants to create He's, when he wants to create humans, he says, let us create them in our image. Now, this has been posited as the divine council, which it might have been. This has been posited as a, 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 a majestic self-reference, a royal self-reference. It could be that. Um, but there's been many people, the early fathers, uh, per, a prominent Italian reformer named Zanke, who, who said that these are shadows of the Trinity involved here. Um, and then what do we have in what dad read today? And, and, and then we sing it. We sing it in the Sanctus. This is called the, uh, the, the Trisegion, the thrice holy, 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 right? We sing this every time we say, lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. And then, and then we sing, you know, we sing holy, holy, holy. We are singing the same thing that the, the seraphim and the cherubim in heaven who are around the throne of God saying, and... Many people have thought, that's interesting. Holy, holy, holy. It's three. And so there is this kind of three in one aspect in here. And the last thing I'll say, just very quickly, we, don't, we, didn't, have the full, we didn't have the full trinity in the Old Testament. The New Testament kind of shows us the fullness of this unity and diversity, which, by the way, is a huge problem in philosophy. And it's kind of beautiful, I think, that our God resolves this in, in the mystery of who he is. But um, one of the things that this shows, this, why it's important of retaining this, is that um, this, is how, this is how the church works itself out. That, that multi multiplicity in persons is the only way that you can demonstrate love. And in that, there is unity. You think about a marriage, there's two persons, but they're united as one. You think about the body of Christ, there's multiple persons and they're united as one. These are not exact analogies, but you see the multiplicity and the unity involved here and that the kind of sacrificial love involved in that brings that kind of unity. So, um, so the very being of God uh, teaches us these things. Let's pray. The charge is this, become like your God. Everyone becomes like their God by how they worship, by how they live their lives. So how do we become like Trinitarians? How do we live like Trinitarians? By contrast, we don't live like Hindus and druggies who see God as everything, uh, that we are one with all creation. So we don't live like them. We don't live like Muslims who see God as merely one and nothing more, which for Muslims results in a God who is nothing more than a God that you submit to. Their God is a God of submission and nothing else. That's why their understandings of power are brutal and malformed. They only understand God as power and submission. But as Trinitarians, we do understand submission and we understand unity, but we have also this other element, which is love. And the three persons of the Trinity exist together in a way in perfect love through sacrifice, through drawing uh, 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 the Holy Spirit, drawing people to Christ, Christ testifying to the Father, the Father testifying to the Son. And we do the same thing. It is impossible to love one another by yourself. You, it, it, it necessarily necessarily involves others, right? So that is what we do as Trinitarians in communion with each other, with others, other persons, but that love draws us together as one, as one people. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.